So this is about Jon Snow's legacy, epidemiology, today and tomorrow. And we hope it's going to be something of a celebration. It's a birthday party, after all, 200 years. And let's treat it as such. Please come down. There are, there are seats. No need to. There's some seats here. Please don't, don't hesitate to come down. Um, and uh, so we celebrate Jon Snow and a, and a birthday, but we also celebra celebrate epidemiology. And uh, hopefully we'll, well, many of us will find that epidemiology is even more interesting and important than we thought when we hear the sorts of things we're going to hear tomorrow in particular. Um, I suspect I'm not the only person here who describes himself from time to time as an epidemiologist. And I have a, an experience which I'm sure many of you have shared. I still have to fill in a form when I come into this country and it asks my occupation. And sometimes I say, uh, veterinary surgeon, no problem. Sometimes I say, university teacher, no problem. Sometimes I say, public health, no problem. Sometimes I put epidemiologist. And, you know, the thing, skin, huh? that sort of thing that comes up. <laughs> and then, they, do you explain? I'm not the only one who's been in that situation. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let's talk about this word, what it means, what we all are. And uh, I call this from Broad Street to Broad View. You know about Broad Street, but the Broad View, there's that widening uh, arrow there. Textbooks often start with Hippocrates, and that, yeah, that's, that's 2,000 years ago, that essay, and he used the word epidemic and means uh, something about upon the people or upon the population. That was the start of it all, and that arrow has got wider and wider over time, and I'm going to tell a few anecdotes about it. Um, leading to the real width, which we will see uh, increasingly as this meeting goes on. Let's see if I can do it from here. Good. Where does that word come into the English language? Well, generally we refer to this. This is, uh, this is the opening page, the preamble to the London Epidemiological Society. Founded in 1850. In this city, it's founded right here. This is the appropriate place to have the birthday party. It all started here. In 1850, and uh, as you see there, it was set up specifically to concern itself with epidemic diseases. And thus, epidemiology sounded a good word. And you'll also see there, there's mentioned in particular, what's the word that comes up first? Cholera. And they say 50 to 60,000 deaths. And those had just occurred in 1848-49, the two years previously in the second pandemic. And I think we'll hear a little bit about that. Look at the, look at the people who assembled. There were 100 people who assembled. And there are, there are uh, seven names there. The first three have diseases named after themselves. Bud wrote the classic work on typhoid. William Farr, need I say more? John Simon, he was a physician who who gave the public health background to the poor law legislation in the 1840s, and his is the name on the front of the school, right straight in front and center, John Simon and John Snow. And I said, you'll see the papers included in that, in that first transaction there, and the only one who presented a paper, and who repeatedly pre presented papers, is John Snow. And uh, that's a paper on mortality in urban and rural areas. And, you can, and it's brilliant. It still is worth reading today. That man could think beautifully and write beautifully. So that's where it started. And that's the granddaddy of the International Epidemiology Association and the SCR and all these epidemiological associations we have. No, that's the granddaddy right there. What about textbooks? Warren Winkelstein, I'm sure known to a number of people here, he was for a while the editor of the AJE. He asked himself the question, what's the first epidemiology textbook? A number of years ago, and he decided it was something called Epidemics and Crowd Diseases, an, an introduction to epidemiology by Major Greenwood. Well, what's that book? Well, interesting, it was written in this building. It was written by the first professor in the first department of epidemiology. Well, we'll see, maybe tied for first, but we'll come to that later. But it was written right here. And it's an interesting book still to look at. Let's look at the, let's look at the contents there. 
It starts with some classics. You've got a big chapter there on Hippocrates and Galen. You have to know. And this is a work of scholarship. Greenwood in this text, he breaks into Greek, he breaks into Latin, he breaks into French, he breaks into... And he doesn't translate it. You're expected to know <laughs> all of those languages, how far we have fallen. <laughs> and then he, everybody has to talk about... Look what he talks about causes. He talks about pro catarctic causes. And I hope that Ken Rothman is here. I haven't yet met him. Uh, he, uh, to talk, uh, you're going to tell us about pro catarctic causes. We forgot about him here over the last 80 years at the, at the school, but I think you may. You assume that you already know that. Oh, oh. <laughs> anyway, those were the kind of causes that uh, we were concerned about 80 odd years ago. And then you see there are a bunch of diseases. Starting with typhoid and then God, look at those diseases and look at, the, look at that list. And the last one there is cancer. There is a chapter on cancers. No cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease, one sentence. One sentence. Disorders of the heart included in a section on psychological consequences <laughs> of war. <laughs> There's a chapter on cholera you see there. Cholera. Ah, there you go, the enthusiast. You read it. Jon Snow is not mentioned. That book was written 20 minutes walk away from Broad Street, and Jon Snow is not mentioned. Interesting, isn't it? We'll come back to that. Textbook number one. Warren Winkelstein didn't say what his favorite was for textbook number two. I'd say this. Um, first edition, 19, 1960. This is no longer about diseases. This is about methods. And you read it, it's all about, or largely about, not all about, largely about non-infectious diseases. This was post-World post War II. This is when cancers and heart disease, etc., had taken off as being of, of uh, moving towards primary importance. And much more complicated without single causal agents. Cox postulates don't work. And so the methods were developed. And, uh, in 1960, look at that beautiful, pristine, with the dust cover still on. Of course, that's Peter Smith's copy. He's the only person who can keep a book for 50 years, and the dust cover is, is, is perfect. I don't know. <laughs> no, there were notes in it. <laughs> now, now, the thing is, Peter, and there are a good many people in this room who started with that book. You know, this is, this is our home. We start, I see some people nodding. Yeah, that's what we started with. And it's interesting to look at the contents for this book. And it's much more familiar. It really is very familiar. You know, there is a chapter, there's chapter number two on causes, and I bet Ken will be really happy and comfortable with all of that. I bet he could tell some anecdotes about what's in that, in that chapter. That's up, up to him. And then we have chapters on person, place, and time. Yeah, familiar there. And then we have three chapters on strategy. And there's cohort studies. Yeah, we know all about them. And then case history studies, you see. Those are case control studies. The word case control doesn't appear. That came after 1960. And it's all there, including the cross product odds ratio. It's all there. The rare disease assumption is all there. They aren't called that, but they're there. And then the next chapter, experimental epidemia. Those are trials. That's what they call the trials, referred in particular to the MRC trials uh, at the time. So in some senses, that's the first textbook of epidemiology as I would say we know it today. And it starts, this is the way it starts. This is its first sentence. It gives the definition. Epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinist of disease prevalence in man. I bet some of us had to memorize that a long time ago. And it's a little bit politically incorrect now. We wouldn't say that. The, edit, the journals and you know, the publisher wouldn't like that. And it's not only the gender specificity, it's, it's the species specificity. It's a bit narrow in retrospect. And then the word prevalence. That's rather interesting. Would you put prevalence there? But if you look back at that time, people were still struggling about incidence versus prevalence, let alone risk versus rate and person time, denominator, and all that. People were struggling. People were writing about it in various ways, but the field hadn't settled to a language. So he called it prevalence. And then disease. 
and then disease. Ah. Well, but previously, we were talking about epidemics, epidemics, disease, but now it's gone to disease, no longer focusing upon epidemics. Talking about disease, and many of the diseases not in epidemic form, being cancer and heart disease and one thing or another. So we sh see the shift in focus quite nicely in that little definition. Oh my goodness, epidemiologists like definitions. <laughs> they get obsessed with definitions and they write papers about definitions. And here's one written a long time ago that already had 27 definitions of it. Can you imagine if somebody were to write that paper now, how many definitions there would be? I'm not going to go into all that. The point is, epidemiologists are obsessed with definitions of themselves and of other things. And I can't help it, can't help it, I, I, have, I have several hobbies, but here among my hobbies, we got a lot of silly terms out there. And, you know, all those chronic diseases that aren't chronic diseases. You know, things associated with HIV virus and all the herpes viruses and the mycobacteria, and these are chronic diseases, but they aren't chronic diseases, are they? Uh. <laughs> and what about all those communicable diseases that aren't commun non they're non communicable diseases? We have David Heyman, the author, there's the, the, the little Bible of communicable diseases there, but you look on the right, that's, that's uh, Chris Murray's latest on the burden, and he talks about non communicable diseases. But a lot of things in David's book liver cancer and, and cervical cancer and Kaposi's, they're all communicable, but they're non-communicable in Chris Murray's. Does it matter? In some ways it does, I think. There's a principle involved, I think, and if we're going to be fussy about definition and we talk about what's your case definition for, I don't care if it's type 2 diabetes or da-da, we're fussy about that, but why aren't we fussy about these sorts of things? Also, for those of us who teach students, many of whom are, don't speak English as their first language, what are we doing to them? <laughs> you know, giving them this sort of nonsense. <sighs> Let alone that commu communicable disease is an oxymoron itself because it's not diseases that are communicated, it's infections that are communicated which may sometimes cause disease. It really is... Uh, there are various phrases for what it is. <laughs> Anyway, that's epidemiologists. Now, of course, now you turn to a, to, a, to a dictionary. You want your definition, you go to a dictionary. Here it is, IEA dictionary. And there's your definition of epidemiology, ep definition number 460. The study of the occurrence of distribution of health-related states or events in specified populations. Can you imagine? A, a, how's that for a conversation killer? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Well, this is what I do. Can anybody memorize that? You know, is there any music or poetry in that at all? <laughs> I don't know. But people think they have to write a new one. <sighs> but it's interesting if you get over the laughter. Look at what... It, disease is gone! Epidemic went, and now disease is gone. This is about health-related states, isn't it? And we have a definition for health. We can go to WHO and we says that it's a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, not that. So now epidemiology is no longer about disease. The epidemiology is now about social well-being. And that's pretty broad. And maybe we have Cesar here from the, you know, president of the IEA, and that's how they're defining it. Look what epidemiologists are doing. It's taking over. That's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. There it is. I told you that arrow got broader and broader. <laughs> Let's look at some textbooks. I went to some shelves upstairs and pulled some textbooks out. And you look there, you see some of your favorites, some of the books you wrote, maybe. Sorry if I left out your favorite or the book you wrote. There's McMahon up there on the left. I would give that priority. Number two there, Uses of Epidemiology, also written in this building by Jerry Morris. And the two in the lower right, the end, are those are two have modern in the title. And we have the authors there. There's Ken, modern, and then Johan, you're here somewhere, modern. Beautiful books. And that's modern. I often wonder when people title their book modern, how it's going to look in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. <laughs> uh, do you have to keep writing, you know, the extinct editions of it, or are you going to write a book postmodern epidemiology? <laughs> and that's when I retire. I'm not interested in it. Okay, but then, you know, there's some other books out there. 
A smaller number, at least in terms of the shelves upstairs, but veterinary epidemiology, a big field out there, and anyone in this country knows those are big problems out there, just the foot and mouth disease cost this country 11 billion pounds in 2001. You all know about BSE in this country leading to new variant CJD, a horrendous problem. This is a very big field. But then also plants, plants. Let's go back to the granddaddy. Transactions of the Epidemiological Society of London, and I blow up a little thing there so you can see there were their, you know, there were their sections, a small box and vaccination, a cholera, of course, Epizootic, the veterinary field, hospitals, very important, continue to, and the committee appointed to inquire into diseases of the vegetable kingdom. <laughs> I think that is interesting, and just think, what this is 1850, and what had just happened? The Irish potato famine. One quarter of the Irish population died, or left, because of a plant disease. That was big stuff. And if you're seriously interested in disease, you don't leave those off. We're progressive. And we're all, you know, the ash trees of Europe are dying out. They're going to be gone in a couple of years. That's big stuff. And any of you looking at the news now, you know that the honeybee population is being wiped out. And they're arguing over whether it's a virus or does it have to do with nicotinoid chemicals. What about that for an epidemiological problem? What are we doing? Those aren't trivial problems. Those are huge problems of diseases out there. So I think that old society was more progressive than many today in thinking what diseases are really important. Or is epidemiology what we teach? Maybe we're getting too fussed in the actual subject matters of what we teach. And hundreds of epidemi students are learn epidemiology in this room every year. And many people in this room Teach it to them here, and many of you teach it in other places. Many of uh, yes? Many of us. What do we teach? Do we teach the age distribution of X and Y and Z? No, this is, I think, what we teach. And I'm rather fun with this, with this diagram. You know, we have two-day courses and one-week courses and two-week courses and one month and one semester and one-year course. Well, that's throwing a lot of it in onto one slide, and I, it's, it's a first draft of, of a, of a, uh, of, um, what's going to be a wall chart. I've always been jealous of the biochemists who have these big wall charts, you know, and there, there's the carbohydrates, and they go to the polysaccharides, and there are the ketones and the aldehydes, and they go to the fatty acids, and there are all the amino acids, and, and in the middle, there's this circle, you know, it's the... Krebs cycle, pumping out ATP that drives the whole thing. And our two-by-two two table is going to be in the middle of this wall poster, <laughs> driving the whole thing. And I don't have population attributable risk, and I don't have odds ratio, and I don't have randomization. I've got around 100 things that's going to be on the big poster anyway. But I think that's, that's what we teach. And yeah, that's all familiar to all of us. I think it's many, for many of us, that's epidemiology. And we teach it, and you say, you go out and apply it to whatever you want to apply it to. And look what people are applying these things to now. And this is just a little taste. I'm just going to read off the titles quickly. Illicit opiate and crime results of an untreated user cohort study. The effects of jail diversion program on incarceration, a retrospective cohort study. Youth cohort study, education, training, and employment of 16 to 18 year olds. Indicators of success in science, technology, engineering, mathematics majors, a cohort study. Hmm, sort of familiar with that. Case control studies. National case control study of homicide offending and gun ownership. Matched case control study of convenience store robbery. Why does family homelessness, homelessness occur? A case control study. The economic cost of conflict, a case control study. And I threw this one in for fun. What factors influence the collapse of trees retained on log sites? A case control study. I know it's all there. <laughs> trials. Lots of literature out there on trials to evaluate sentencing regimens. The one in the middle, assessing the feasibility of conducting a randomized controlled trial study of an acronym that probably nobody knew. I didn't. 
prison addressing substance relating offending. More trials. Case for randomized trials in economic and policy research. Remedying education evidence from randomized trial experiments in India. You get the point. I think all of us are very comfortable with those, and I think having taught up, I would know how to go about those things, but that's not what we teach. It's not in our epidemiology textbooks. It's not what our epidemiology journals talk about. It's not what our current... But that's all going on out there. What is the relationship of that stuff to what we're teaching here? It's a very close and interesting relationship. So where are the, where are the boundaries of epidemiology? Well, I don't know. And maybe they're certainly moving, and maybe there aren't any boundaries. Cesar is going to take over. We'll say what we're going to take over. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, I think in particular tomorrow, we'll think about when we hear some of the wonderful things. People, and there's no question that that feels, smells like epidemiology, doesn't it? And it's also extremely important, those things that are, people are doing. I'd even say, I'll go so far to say a lot of it's more important than some of the things that are published in our routine epidemiology journals. They're using it. Anyway, and it's up to us to decide how to deal with that. Okay. I'm not going to have discussion on this now. I think a number of people are burning to say something, but it would preempt the discussion we have tomorrow when people talk about these things. Well, let's return to here. Now, here's the school, and there are all those names at the top, and Simon in the middle. And, you know, there's Pasteur and Koch and Manson and Ross and all those names we're all familiar with. No John Snow! No John Snow. If you look over there on the east side of the school, you see this Pettenkoffer, who was of the German hygiene movement, who spent much of his career trying to disprove John Snow. We put him on the building. He drank a cc of fresh culture in public to discipline. He wrote a lot, you know. And Ken, you may, and David may talk about refuting cause. Anyway, it's all there on our building. But of course, that's just the decoration for the building, isn't it? Here we are in the John Snow Hall, which is the throbbing heart of the institution <laughs> and named after John Snow. And so that's right, isn't it? That's the way it should be. But how did it come about? Now we'll return to that first textbook of epidemiology because while Major Greenwood was in this building writing that first textbook, the other first professor of epidemiology, the other first department of epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, incidentally, a little anecdote, that this building and that building on North Wolf Street, they're very similar, the original designs, both built funded by the International Health Division of the Rockefeller Foundation, which really deserves a lot of credit for public health. They built the institutions. We're in one right now. That professor was Wade Hampton Frost, and he wasn't writing a textbook, but he was encouraging the republication of this book, the second edition of Snow on Cholera. It's a wonderful book, and the next speaker is going to talk about it. Well, I'll just end by referring to, he writes a lovely essay on what epidemiology is, is the introduction. And I love that phrase. Epidemiology at any given time is something more than the total of its established facts. It includes orderly arrangement into chains of inference. A nearly perfect model is John Snow's analysis of the epidemiology of cholera. That's why we're here today. That person finding that book and pointing out its importance to epidemiology. I think it's why we're here today. That's a long introduction to this meeting and also to our next speaker, who is Nigel Paneth, who knows more about epidemiology than I do and anyone else. Physician, Harvard, Einstein, Columbia, uh, perinatal epidemiologist, Michigan State, head of the epidemiology department there for the last 25 or, I don't know, many years, long time, and a man who f fascinated with John Snow and who wrote the definitive biography. Um, I think we all have our favorite opening words. You know, this is the 
best of time, the worst of time, call me Ishmael, whatever your favorite <laughs> opening. You look at the opening sentence of Nigel's book, and it'll go on your list of, of um, great first lines in Western literature. Nigel, it's great to have you here. Thank you.